Hello, my name is Dr. Scott Manich, and we have a special privilege today to talk with Harold Netland on the topic of religious pluralism in our world today. Dr. Netland comes to us today as the author of one of several essays written by top evangelical scholars on hot button issues from a Christian perspective, distributed through the nonprofit ministry of Christ on Campus Initiative. Dr. Netland is Professor of Philosophy of Religion and Intercultural Studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where he has taught since 1993. His publications include Dissonant Voices, Religious Pluralism and the Question of Truth, published in 1999, and Encountering Religious Pluralism, The Challenge to Christian Faith and Mission, published by InterVarsity Press in 2001. Dr. Nutland, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Scott. It's good to be with you. More and more Christians encounter friends, family members, and neighbors who firmly believe very different things about God and religious truth than they do. Christians may well ask, can I really be right about these things when so many millions of people disagree with me? What would you want to say to people who ask that question? Yeah, well, several things. Um, First, I think we're aware of uh, disagreement today in a way that we weren't before because of globalization and uh, technology, travel, um, migrations of people around the world. So whereas, say, 50 or 100 years ago, it was possible to be surrounded by people who largely think like you do and share your beliefs, today that's increasingly uh, difficult. And so this uh, urgent sense of uh, difference and diversity and disagreement is something that uh, young children pick up very quickly. Uh, first thing to say is uh, the majority has been wrong many times in history. So uh, simply going with the majority opinion on a subject is not necessarily the wise thing to do. Uh, not that long ago the uh, consensus was that the earth was flat. And of course today we know differently. Uh, so the important thing is on uh, religious matters to know what you believe and then to ask the question, am I really justified in believing what I believe? So as Christians, what is it that we really believe? And uh, then why do we believe what we believe? Uh, the uh, sad fact is regardless of what position you take on this issue, whether you're just a flat out atheist, uh, you're a Buddhist, you're a Taoist, you're a Hindu, you're a Muslim, uh, you're some kind of New Ager. Uh, whatever position you take on the question of religious truth, the implication is the majority of people throughout history and in the world today disagree with you. And so it's not only a problem for Christians, uh, this is simply a fact of our world. There's widespread disagreement on these matters. Now, some people consider it the highest of arrogance for Christians to claim to have the only right answer to the deepest questions of life, uh, death, and meaning. In your view, is that a, a valid assessment? Yeah, this is a tricky one. Um, arrogance and uh, intolerance really are not properties of what you happen to believe. Uh, they're properties of how we uh, behave, how we treat other people, our attitudes, and our actions. Uh, so for someone to have a particular belief that others uh, disagree with and may even find objectionable by itself is not a mark of arrogance or intolerance. Um, how you uh, live out that belief, how you interact with those who disagree with you, that's where these issues of arrogance and tolerance, intolerance come in. Uh, I have known flat out pluralists who believe uh, all religions are just different ways of uh, encountering the mysterious divine reality out there. Uh, I've known pluralists who can be very arrogant and very intolerant. And I've known very, very exclusivistic believers, not only Christians but also Buddhists, uh, who can be remarkably respectful and tolerant of other people. So you need to be careful about how you sort through that one. Yeah, thank you. You spent a number of years in a very different culture in Japan. How has your experience as a missionary influenced your understanding of religious diversity? Well, I grew up in Japan, and uh, so as a child, I, I lived in a society in which uh, 99 out of 100 uh, Japanese would not be Christian. 
And we lived in the northern part of Japan, which uh, had even fewer Christians. And so um, from a very early age, uh, I was very much aware of the fact that we were different and uh, the Japanese believers were different from the other Japanese. Um, I think this has helped me to uh, appreciate what it means to be a religious minority in a society that is dominated by another religious perspective. And uh, one of the things that you learn in Japan uh, is uh, there aren't too many nominal Christians. Uh, if you're going to take a stand as a follower of Jesus, this is something you think through carefully, um, you work it through over a period of time, and by the time you come to the point where you say, I'm going to follow Jesus in baptism, uh, you're making a very definite stand. Mm -hmm. And so generally the Japanese Christians uh, know what they believe, they're committed to it, and, uh, and you don't have a lot of lukewarm nominal mm -hmm. Christians. Mm -hmm. Now, as Christians, how much validity should we give to other religions? Can we learn religious truth from them, for example? How much can we affirm before we begin to sacrifice our own religious convictions? This is another uh, difficult question, and I think uh, much depends on how you frame the question. You framed it in a very helpful way. Uh, in answering it, I would want to uh, go first to the commonalities that we have as a human beings created by God in His image. And uh, I lived in Japan for many years. Uh, Japanese are people, they're, they're like you and I. Uh, they have families, they work hard. Um, they have high ethical standards. Uh, like all of us, they fail to meet their ethical standards and so on. If you begin from the perspective of creation, God the Creator, human beings as God's creatures, uh, then you will begin with a position that sees certain commonalities across cultures and even across religions. I think um, you will find a significant commonality across religions when it comes to ethical teachings, for example. Uh, it's very interesting in the Confucian Analects written uh, three to five centuries before Christ, you have twice the statement of the Golden Rule. Uh, and then later in the writings on Mencius, the same thing. Uh, I don't find that problematic. Uh, the Chinese created in God's image, uh, God's common grace, God's general revelation uh, is available to them. And so I, I would expect to find these kinds of commonalities across religious traditions. Now, of course, you're going to find a lot of differences. Uh, many religions don't believe in a creator God. And so that's a fundamental difference between uh, Christian teachings and other religions. And uh, those that do believe in a creator, uh, classical Judaism and Islam, for example, will disagree with Christianity on the question of the incarnation and the Trinity. So there are clear fundamental differences. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be open to the complexity of religious traditions and how religious people actually live today in communities. And where we find similarities, we affirm them. And where we find differences, we also clearly acknowledge the differences. Now, Dr. Natlin, you've studied many of the world's great religions. What is it that makes Christianity unique or sets it apart in your view? The heart of the Christian message is that the eternal Creator God becomes part of the created order in the Incarnation. God the Son becomes a human being. Uh, in the first century, and does this uh, in order to redeem and make possible reconciliation between a sinful humanity and a righteous and a holy God. Uh, you simply do not find that in other religions. And I think this is what sets it apart. Uh, a righteous, holy, merciful, loving God seeking and reaching out to sinful humanity and God Himself becoming flesh. To provide, and of course, through the cross and the resurrection, providing a way of reconciliation for human beings. Uh, I simply don't see that anywhere else. That's very helpful. Well, one final question. Uh, what would you say in, in conclusion to Christians who are wrestling with this matter of the exclusivity of Christ? It's a big issue, especially for Christians in the West. Uh, Christians in India, in uh, China, in Japan have wrestled with these issues for many, many years. 
But in the West, this is a new set of issues, partly because uh, Western society and Western culture is changing so rapidly. And uh, I think we need to be intentional in training our young people from a very early age, uh, on the one hand, uh, to be comfortable with diversity, ethnic diversity, cultural diversity, uh, diversity in lifestyles, and so on. And at the same, t that's the world we live in, and, mm -hmm. and that's not going to change. Uh, but then at the same time, to understand very clearly what it is that we believe, and it really comes back to the person of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Is there a God? Who is Jesus Christ? Uh, and if the picture of the New Testament is correct, and I'm convinced it is, then Jesus is not simply one religious leader among other great religious leaders. And there are many great religious leaders. But even looking at the others uh, in the best possible light, and then looking at Jesus in the New Testament, um, it's apples and oranges. And so, on the one hand, we need to be comfortable in a society that is increasingly diverse and people do not share our values and our convictions. And at the same time, know exactly what it is that we believe and why we believe it. Dr. Netlin, thank you so much for addressing this very important topic today.